Welcome back to this week's episode of the State of Recruiting, your weekly Horns 24-7 recruiting podcast. I'm Mike Roach, and I'm joined as always by Hudson Standish. Uh, And before we get into today's action, Hudson, how's it going? Going good, Mike. Let's get this thing started. Well, it's been uh, been some stuff happening since uh, since we last talked to you. I think the biggest news probably uh, to come out of those, uh, you know, the last week or so is um, we're kind of down to the I think finish line on Arch Manning. Uh, you know, the the five star quarterback from Isidore Newman has scheduled visits. There's been a big quarterback domino fall in that recruitment, um, and so. You know, fingers crossed this thing could end this summer. And, um, you know, let's first start with uh, kind of the visits. He's uh, he's going to do uh, – well, we'll see. The three schools that have been running out in front for him, uh, basically from the beginning of this recruitment, Georgia, Alabama, and Texas, he had visits scheduled too. Earlier this week, a big domino fell when quarterback Eli Holstein committed to Alabama. Um, I, I obviously think in that case, okay, that visit's going to get canceled. Um, I just haven't heard that it has been yet, so I can't say for sure it has, but obviously I think this one's going to come down to Georgia and Texas. I think Georgia will be on the, uh, that'd be the first week in the June. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, Texas will be, uh, June 19th, I believe will be the, or so or is it 17th. Uh, it's somewhere around that third week of June. Um, he'll be in Austin for the last official visit. First of all, and I heard them discussing this on the 24 7 uh, sports recruiting podcast with Blair and Gulo. Uh, and so if you want to, uh, there's, a, there's a quick plug for Blair's podcast. Go listen to that for, for daily stuff. But Hudson, do you think it's advantageous that they, or, or do you think it means anything that Texas got the last visit in this deal? Yeah, I do. I, I think that has. Historically, when you look at visit data, it does matter. Now, I don't think that the Mannings would tip their hand, so I don't think that it's – I don't think that it means everything, but it's definitely uh, worthwhile. Also, I mean, he hasn't officially uh, ended the visit to Alabama, but I think that we all kind of know that it's just a formality until that is – that visit's either – taken off or replaced by another school. And I mean, you know how I feel about this, Mike, even if he did replace it with Florida or LSU, I don't think it matters. I think that it's kind of what we've known for a while that it's down to Georgia and Texas since I reported, I think in early April and basically the entire college football recruiting world is kind of known that Alabama put a red circle around Eli Holstein and we're probably going to take him as a little bit of insurance so that they could get off of this, you know, quarterback recruiting carousel in the 23 cycle. I think that for a school like Alabama, there was a real worry about ending up overextending themselves in the Arch Manning recruitment and then not ending up with a good take in the 23 cycle, which they kind of, you know, needed to have. So, Works out well for Texas. And another interesting thing with the Arch Manning recruitment is that following his Texas official visit, the next weekend is the Manning Passing Academy, I believe, in uh, Thibodeau, Louisiana, on Nichols State's campus. And, Mike, I've kind of theorized this to you and also on the board, but I think that if a summer, especially if a June decision, decision does happen, I think that makes the most sense because it allows the Mannings to kind of control completely the narrative and also it brings a lot of eyeballs to arch's decision more than there already would be i know that he could end up on espn or cbs anytime that he wanted so we're kind of sneaky maybe getting to the finish line but you always do have that added bit of intrigue with the mannings where you kind of don't know okay are we just tricking ourselves into thinking it could be a late june decision when in reality they might take this thing to december who knows yeah, and I think that um, you know doing it the mass uh, the Manning Passing Academy would make a lot of sense. Um, that is something that's obviously very special to that family. It's something, you know, I was told Arch is not you know required to go to and loves going to every year. Obviously, so um, 
you know, I guess we'll we'll kind of see how that plays out. I talked a little a couple weeks ago after I went to New Orleans about Alabama and Eli Holstein and um, just kind of said, yeah, I think they like Eli Holstein a lot, but I don't think they're bowing out of the race yet for Arch Manning. And, you know, they were there pretty strong the day I was there for his first practice. From what I've heard, they were, were a pretty strong presence at his spring game. It makes me wonder if they just got to the place where they couldn't turn Holstein down or if they got some information in the Manning race that that made them uh, move on and go with him. Yeah, I, I kind of think what happened is that they maybe gave it one last push, one last blitz, and when it kind of remained status quo, I think then they knew it was time. Okay, well, we've got to kind of protect ourselves. I mean, Mike, you know this better than anybody just because you've been boots on the ground with Arch's decision, but there aren't like wild swings, which mm-hmm. is a abnormality for most recruitments. Yeah, and I think that you're kind of seeing that with all the new staffs trying to get in the mix and, you know, kind of failing and Alabama not being able to make up ground. It's just one of those things where your normal recruitment swings and your chances that you take kind of don't matter here. It's, it's just been steady basically since last summer. It's a great point. I was thinking about it the other day, and I'm like, we haven't had like a major uh oh moment in the arch recruitment, and maybe we won't. I'm just used to them. I'm, I'm used to like, yeah. okay, where is the part where this thing goes sideways? Um, and uh, that hasn't happened yet. And I think that is a testament to the way they're operating their recruitment um, and the way they've kind of you know, gone about everything. So, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, uh, you know, I think we've all, a lot of us in the industry have been saying for almost a year now, this is a Texas Georgia battle. I mean, I, I, Alabama was in it, but it's always felt like it'd be Texas or Georgia. I think if you, so uh, I was the other day, I was trying to, I was trying to approach a recruitment from the view of a, uh, a neutral and just say, okay, what would, uh, you know, if I presented a pros and cons list for each school or a, uh, you know, if I gave you a blind resume for each school, like the the, the features, which school would they pick? And um, thinking about it, obviously, Georgia, the returning national champions, um, winning a lot of games, they're putting guys in the league. Uh, Todd Monken is a guy that Arch does have a relationship with, a really good relationship, and they've got a lot of admiration for uh, he has developed a few quarterbacks in his career. So all those things help. Um, I just think, based on what I know, the combination of Steve Sarkeesian and A.J. Milwee, who Arch has an extremely strong relationship with, um, and a uh, you know a great admiration for their offensive style. And I really think, like, I, you know, I maybe I overrate this a lot with Arch. I think he loves Austin. Like no, I don't think that's overrated at all. I think that a lot of national analysts underrate it because there is this feeling of, okay, well, the football fit matters so much. Who cares if he likes you know, the university or whatever? But I don't know. Everything that we hear, Mike, is that that – you know, true university side of things matters more for the Mannings than it does your average five-star quarterback. So I don't know. I think think it matters a lot that he loves Austin and he loves the University of Texas. And I think it matters a lot that his sister basically would have ended up at Texas if not for getting into a pretty good uh, school at Virginia. So I, I do think that actually matters more than a lot of people in the know kind of let on. I think, I think too, it's like people make that up. I mean, Arch has never said the football fit matters most to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, and he's never said it in, in any quote I've ever read. And I think the one thing that happens over and over when you got to Newman and you talk to the people around him is the thing they stress is Arch is a very, very normal, regular kid. What do normal, regular kids want? They want a, you know, a cool place to go to college, a place they like, a place they enjoy. Um But, you know, obviously Texas has work to do on the field to catch up to where Georgia is. But I think that, you know, I think with Sark and uh, Austin and and the work they've done in the portal, I think those are things you can present to him and say, look, we're we're kind of on the way. Here's an interesting question. I heard Cooper Patagna mention this because he went to Arch's spring game. 
he said that um, he feels that the thing with the Alabama and Georgia presented for Arch were finality, whereas Texas didn't have that as much. Where Alabama and Georgia established programs, um, they're nothing to the field. Whereas if he were to admit to Texas and they were to struggle again, they feel or he feels, you know, like kind of like maybe that recruitment wouldn't be over. I personally can't see the Mannings of handle it handling it this way this far and then him committing decommitting taking other visits i think in my opinion once he commits he's he's done what do you think yeah i mean if they're not ready to commit to texas like you know they're <laughs> they're just going to take the decision into the fall and see um and see exactly how they look on the field like kind of like you said, I there's just no way that I can see the Mannings uh, making a decommitment. Um, while I do think it would be kind of funny because it's almost like a Manning recruitment entering the you know modern recruiting era, just because you know Eli and Cooper and Peyton all handled their recruitments you know 20 years ago, so it would be the mark of a kind of new era of Manning recruiting. But I just. I just I'm right. sorry. I'm just envisioning like this circle and it's like Archie, like, well, what do you think we'd have to do? And Peyton's like, well, you know, the kids do, they decommit now. We could yeah, do that. You, you, <laughs> can, yeah, like, you can tell them that you just respect the decision and apparently yeah. they have yeah, it's like it's in in and Eli's like, does anybody have a notes app? I think you can write it on the notes app. And, yeah, uh, like like the the Mannings are the type that they get confused and they'd be like, notes app? No, we'll just write a note to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a funny visual I have in my head now. Um, but yeah, right. I mean, I'm with you, Mike. I just kind of can't see that. It's one of those things to where I think that you know, I think that that is a consideration for the Mannings. And I think that's one reason why we don't have some finality uh, as far as like, okay, he's going to be for sure decided by his, um, you know, by the start of his senior year, because they're smart. They don't want to box themselves in. We see this so much with kids, Mike, where it's like, oh yeah, well, I'm, I'm deciding by my senior year for sure. And then they're not exactly sure what they want to do. And they feel this pressure to make a decision rush into something because they told somebody or they made an edit that they were going to decide like the Mannings are smart. They're not going to box themselves in. That's why every quote you hear from Arch is like, yeah, when I'm ready, I'll decide. So I think for Texas, people have asked like, what do they have to do on the visit? What do they have to, you know? And I've kind of always said, just keep running the same race they've been running. They've been doing a really good job just doing what they've been doing. But now maybe it's a case of, Hey, we've got to, I think, in my opinion, going into the season's a risk. It's a big risk uh, with him. I think, I think they've got to do what they can to convince him to when he leaves Austin that okay, you're ready to make your decision and we're the place for you right now. Yeah, and also, just from his recruitment in a vacuum, yeah, they they need to shut it down as soon as possible. I think that's pretty, but. When you're looking at the entire 2023 class, Mike, it's like if you get him to commit the last week in June or the first week of July, it does so much for the last two months of recruiting heading into the season for everyone around. I mean, I we did a recruiting chat and somebody, um, I think Professor Biggs actually on the board mentioned something around the point of like, hey, you know, other than this, you know, hypothetical Arch Manning recruiting wave that we always hear about, um, who are some like actual names that would maybe be off the radar that could hop into the mix for Texas? And I kind of like the way that he put that because it has become such a cliche that Texas fans know now of, okay, well, if Arch, you know, gets in the class, there's going to be this tidal wave of, of recruiting momentum but the truth is that really will happen and you have two months of that before the season it's just one of those things mike to where i don't know it'll just be gut check time if things stay consistent for if the mannings you know trust that texas mm -hmm. is on the right track and i think that one point that i've heard mentioned a couple times from different people and i agree with if he does take it into the season 
then that's just confirmation that Texas leads because if Texas didn't lead, he'd probably shut it down at his ideal timeline before, uh, you know, senior season starts. Yeah. I would say I am somewhat surprised. I'm somewhat surprised he's not prioritizing getting the decision done and, and helping whatever school he goes to recruit others. But I was, and I don't think he's not interested in that. Obviously, he's been talking to a lot of kids behind the yeah. scenes. Um, but I also think he wants to. Be, I, I don't know, man. I'm just there's two kids in this in this cycle. I'm just extremely impressed with the way they're handling their recruitment. I, I more than that. I mean, you and I talked about Braylon Shelby the other day. He's another one of them. But like Arch and Javi and Taviano, I think are just um, playing uh, playing the recruiting game at a like at a 30 year old level instead of like an 18 year old level. So yeah, uh, I think both of them, we'll, we'll get, we'll talk a little bit about Taviano here in a second. For sure. One last thing on Arch real quick too, unless you had something else, but what did you think about Alabama strategy to take Holstein? Like when it really came to gut check time, just like not even taking the visit. I, it, it's, it's, one of the more interesting national things other than Nico Imaliva going to Tennessee in this cycle, I think. And we didn't even mention the element of the fact that they, you know, had a delayed flip from AM for Holstein. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the Jimbo versus Saban beef has escalated in case any listeners haven't been on the internet in about two weeks. I think it's just a true indicator that, to me, that Alabama wasn't in that top two that they knew that at best they were at best, maybe they were tied for two, probably third in that race. And they weren't going to, I don't blame them. And, and look, man, they're like, Hey, we're Alabama. We're not going to get held hostage by anybody, you yeah. know, regardless. So, um, you know, they, I one think more thing, best for them. One more thing too, Mike, early on in the process, we've kind of heard that Nico really liked Alabama and of course, you know, they decided to go after Arch. Do you think any part of that could have played into it of, look, in the sweepstakes, we already probably lost out on one top five quarterback because, you know, we prioritize somebody else. Like, let's not, let's yeah. not let it extend. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a great point. I think that obviously, you know, it's a, it's a scary game to play. I, I tell people these high leverage quarterback battles are, are, I mean, it is like having 16 on the table and blackjack and hitting. It's just you don't – you know, like you could you, you could go either way with it. And it's it's high leverage. It's big swings. It's, um, you know, the stakes have never been higher. And it's, you know, if you fail, the, the ramifications are pretty bad. So um, and, I just don't think they were interested in playing that game much longer. Yeah, and Mike, doesn't don't you think that that is probably one of the best I don't know cards that Steve Sarkeesian has in its in his hand that as long as I'm head coach, basically the majority of these nationally elite quarterback recruitments I'm going to be in. Yeah, I mean it's if you look at it. I thought yeah, maybe uh, Malik Murphy was rated as a nationally elite quarterback when he got him last year. But I think that for for them, that was a case of getting something done. If you look at what they're doing in 2024 with Julian Sayan and, and, and they were in it with Rayola, and Rayola. Even Devin Brown turned into a nationally, you know, elite guy. A that huge recruitment. Yeah. 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 Huge and story so, down the stretch. Exactly. And so that plus, I think, his ability to make changes with bringing in Tashard Choice and Brennan Marion, who, by the way, I did a little bit of a pat on the back for both of us. I know I touched my shoulder, but I mean, we kind of nailed the impact that those two would have on the recruiting trail, both of us. Like that plus bringing in Gary Patterson, which seems to have helped a lot behind the scenes and just as an overall culture thing, like I think that those two things, like the ability to adapt and make good hires, plus the ability that you know that you're always going to field pretty good offenses, if not elite offenses in the future, and you're always going to be in it for the most valuable position in football at the highest level of recruiting. Like, 
Mm-hmm. That's something I think Texas fans, you know, 99 days from kickoff should be a little bit excited about. Like, oh, yeah, we do have Steve Sarkeesian as our coach. He can do this for us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Uh, anything else on Arch before we move on to our next segment? I don't think so, other than the fact that Texas fans might clip uh, around 15 minutes if we're like, yeah, no, no big crazy swings here. And then, you know, in a month or two, he's committed to Louisiana Lafayette or whatever. Surely that that can't come back to backfire on us. Um, All right. Lanes, Arch Manning. Before we move on to our next segment, we're going to take a break here uh, so you can hear from our sponsors. If you are watching on YouTube, we're going to keep rolling. If you're listening on the podcast, we'll be back right after this. All right. uh, This week, actually, Texas did get a commitment uh, from a transfer wide receiver. They didn't get Jordan Addison. Uh, We talked a lot about that, Hudson. But uh, they were able to bring in Tariq Milton, uh, the Iowa State transfer receiver, speedy guy, um, add some pop to the offense. Maybe not what – no, I'm not going to say maybe not. Not what you were going to get from Jordan Addison. Um, But, you know, if you need a body and you need a guy just for, you know, for depth, and I think if you're taking a depth body, a guy that has the type of explosive ability Tariq Milton has, that's not a bad way to go about it. I think – I don't know how you feel about this, Mike, but I think that during the Addison sweepstakes – and we know that contact with Milton um, was initially prior to that. But I think that the Texas staff kind of convinced themselves that, okay, this extra receiver really would help. And when I look at Tariq Milton and I look at his skill set and what he did at Iowa State, obviously he had a very good, I believe, sophomore season – and then didn't really take that next step. He kind of reminds me of an Iowa State version of Jordan Whittington. And I think that you can see the vision of maybe him just being Whittington insurance a little bit with the injury concerns, but also just another body that you can throw out there in the slot that can be a third down, uh, you know, target generator. And somebody that has the requisite speed to play in the Steve Sarkeesian system. Like, he's a legit burner. So he is going to be thought of as, as a more of a body. Um, but when you lose the amount of depth pieces Texas did from the portal, which I don't think that any of us are, you know, super concerned about the guys that did leave, but I think that it was actually a smart move because – he, you know, all the hypotheticals about Addison adding to the wide receiver room, you kind of did start to get this feeling of, okay, maybe they really do need to add just one more. Yeah. I mean, obviously that was a huge priority for them. I think Sark said it going into the summer, you know, hey, we're adding another receiver one way or another. And, you know, I had talked to people who had said it's kind of Addison or bust. Um, but obviously when, you know, once the Addison thing didn't happen – they moved pretty quick on Tariq Milton um, and made that happen. So, um, you know, if anything, I, I kind of like it because as much as I would have liked to have seen Addison and what he could do in this offense, I kind of like it because they get a body, they get a, you know, a guy, I, again, with a, a lot of times when you're getting a depth guy, it's just like, okay, this guy is just kind of a guy. But getting a guy with the type of traits he has speed-wise is, is always good. And then – you're still not getting to the point where, okay, how are we going to feed all these mouths? Um, yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, your development, your tight ends can still happen and, uh, you know, you can still get the ball around. So obviously you'd rather finish first for Jordan Addison and just kind of solve that problem on your own. But in the meantime, I think, um, you know, they, they, they figured out what to do. Uh, they're also trying to figure out what to do at linebacker. Earlier this week, they uh, hosted uh, Diamante Tucker Dorsey, the leading FCS uh, tackler. Is that right? Um, uh, at I don't linebacker. know if he was leading, but he was 120 tackles. So, I mean, he's up there. Yeah, at James Madison, well, I believe was an All-American. Um, and uh, I think um, that recruitment is uh, – boy, you, you talk about the anti-arch recruitment and swings back and forth. Uh, the Tucker Dorsey recruitment has been that, um, kind of in a short little stint that it's been there. Uh, it sounds like he's got a lot of people in his ear talking to him and, and telling him about where he needs to go. I think we had an indication him leaving a campus on uh, Wednesday. Was that his last day? Um, 
Yeah, I believe it was Wednesday. Uh, Tuesday, was the last, Wednesday. Maybe well, Tuesday. I think Wednesday was the last day of his visit. Uh, we had an indication then that, um, you know, I, Texas felt really good, that they felt like they had done just about everything. He had given them an indication that he felt that, you know, this could be a future home for him. So uh, put it a pick. And then I, th- I think A&M's kind of come in late um, and trying to uh, – trying to get you on campus as well. So uh, it's going kind of back and forth. UCF's in there also. So we'll just kind of see what the timing works out. I think he's enjoying this process a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. I would assume that this ends with him eventually committing to Texas just with the initial feedback that we got. And the fact that if A&M doesn't really push hard, then you're looking at a Texas versus UCF decision and everything that we heard you know leading up to the potential late involvement there was even some rumors that usc was trying to get into the mix um before all of that it seemed like it was pretty clear texas so i don't know we'll see mike what something that's interesting with me i don't know if you've watched film of his i've watched highlights and tried to go watch a full game um as well he is undersized, and I don't think that he's necessarily the mover that um, even Gary Johnson was when you talk about undersized linebackers. But he does have very good instincts. He reads the triangle extremely well, and I think that he would just be a veteran presence for this Texas linebacker room to where you could pair him with DeMarvian Overshone, then rotate in Jalen Ford and David Benda, and it maybe makes it a little bit easier to know, okay, the offense is in a 12 personnel set with you know their two tight ends stacked this way. We're going to be lined up properly, and we're going to know what to do if they run pin and pull, if they run power, whatever. Like He's going to be able to get to his assigned gap. So I think that that is kind of the vision with this potential take. And my overall question is, and I don't know if you have a take on this, Mike, I don't know what his ceiling is at the uh, Power 5 football level. I wish that I had a little bit more info, and if he does end up on campus, I'm going to be really intrigued to see come practice time how he's uh, reportedly looking. Because I don't know if his ceiling is an all-conference type dude or if he's just going to be a nice little plug-and-play piece for a year or so. Yeah, I think it's probably that. Um, I think they're just in a position where they can't be overly picky um, at at the linebacker position right now, and they need somebody. So I I, I think probably I'd lean more towards like a depth body than a than a future All American, but uh, or All Conference guy. Uh, But you know, maybe I'm wrong. I've only seen a couple of highlights of him, so I haven't watched full game or anything. And and Mike, you know this too, but like linebacker recruiting in the portal is you know, almost let a F-bomb loose, but it's freaking tough. Like, you, you rarely get even FCS All-American caliber of guys uh, at linebacker in the portal. Like, that's one of the spots to where you really need to build out from high school recruitment or, you know, you end up having to take, and, you know, this is no <laughs> not trying to be a ricochet shot to him because I actually think that he's improved a lot while on campus, but, like, you know, you don't want to just take Devin Richardson type players in the portal. You want to take your, you you want to use those spots on your Ryan Watts, your um, Ajay Halls, your Quinn Ewers type portal. Yeah, I think you want Tariq Milton to be the floor of your class. You exactly. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I I agree with you on that. Linebacker recruiting in the portal is like getting in a knife fight at this point. Um, it is. Yeah. It's it's probably more dicey than quarterback recruiting or any of that. It's just – it's such uh, a, a valuable so. commodity. I think so with the obvious caveat. If you're an Alabama or Georgia type defense that, you know, puts linebackers in the NFL on a very consistent basis, it's, it's a little bit easier – for a Henry Toto or whoever to convince, yeah, just you know, plug and play in here and then go to the yeah, game. yeah. I mean, if you can get one of those guys to go, but like Texas had, I think um, I'm blanking on his name, the Alabama linebacker that was going to transfer this year. Was it uh, something? I'm blanking like, on that name too, man. That was um, a while back. It like sounded like that was a done deal, and then all of a sudden, Bama was like, "Now we need you back. Uh, we're going to have a spot for you." So um, it's been kind of a, a 
an offseason like that for Texas at the linebacker position. All right. Um, I mentioned a little earlier we talked about JV and Taviano. I had a really in-depth conversation with him the other day. Quotes um, were dynamite. It's probably still up on the site if somebody hasn't read it yet. Yeah, because quotes are up on the site. Um, a story with him, and, and it was over a 1,000 words uh, worth of quotes. Uh, just from what he gave me, and that's a testament to Javion for going. Javion for going really in depth um, on everything, and that's I love that kid so much because he's not available all the time. I can't get him to always necessarily answer a text message or a phone call, but he put out on Twitter, "Hey, I'm doing interviews today," um, and so I texted him real quick. He called me immediately, um, and I said, "Hey, what are you doing, man? Your own you get your own media tour going on or what?" And he said, "No." He goes, "You know." I know a bunch of you guys have been asking me for interviews and I got some time today. So I figured I'd just do them today. Um, and so the thing I love about it too is, you know, when you get him in that situation, he's not giving you half answers or anything. He's giving you real thoughtful answers on everything. I thought taking away from that story, you know, I think for one, you've got to, you've got to kind of filter it and that Javian says glowing things about everybody. He's just a really good, nice kid. Um, and he's not going to really dog anybody on, on, on the record. The thing I really took away from it is I asked him about, you know, kind of the relationships he has with head coaches and how he would characterize his, his relationship with Sark and how he would characterize that amongst the rest of the head coaches recruiting him. And, you know, he pretty much said, Hey, uh, I think Sark's probably the guy I've got the best relationship with at this point. So, um, you know, obviously that's none of that's enough to get it done. Uh, on its own, I think they're going to have to run the race and uh, do what they need to do. But I think Texas is still, you know, still standing in a pretty good position for uh, for the five star corner. Yeah, I, and I, one we've talked about how smart Toviano is and how mature he is. A while S scheduling your own media availability is kind of up there as far as chess moves from recruits. So. Uh, big kudos to him on that. And I think that that also might just dispels this theory of like, oh, well, the media guys only like the guys that talk to him all the time and give him everything. It's like, no, Javian's pretty isolated when it comes to that. He's extremely kind in person and is ridiculously smart. But, you know, it's not about contact level. It's about, you know, how authentic you are and, you know, kind of everything else. I mean, there are kids that will – want to do an interview every time we talk to them or even seek them out that, you know, we're maybe not as eager to talk to as a guy like him. So, but then I don't know, as far as his recruitment goes to Mike, I think that Texas is in a better spot than people think. Obviously a and M recruiting as well as they are and their relationship with Toviano definitely has kind of put some hesitancy uh, into the hearts of some Texas fans, but I'd say that I probably feel better about Toviano than I do even Anthony Hill. Um, another yeah. five star that is kind of in that same regional recruiting battle. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I'm, I think, sorry, go ahead. So, by the way, Mike, how crazy is it? I mean, if you would have told, you know, past Mike from last summer of, hey, uh, in a year, JV and Toviano is going to put out a top eight and Oklahoma is not going to be in it. Um, yeah, I think that's just kind of the way the recruitment's moved a lot. It's really surprising because, you know, uh, Jay Valai was one of the first guys to offer Toviano when he was at Texas. Uh, the two had a really good relationship. And I thought, okay, well, when Valai got hired at Oklahoma, I thought well, that's going to be probably a feather in their cap. And uh, it's just kind of gone the other way. So uh, we yeah, see that from time to time, you know. And I'm sure that overall everything will be okay with Oklahoma recruiting. I mean, Brent Venables does know what he's doing. I'm not saying that he doesn't or anything, but, um, you know, lose, getting Cozart flipped to Oregon, missing out for Toviano, it seems like they're running kind of distant on Anthony. Like, there's just a lot of guys that I expected Oklahoma to be contenders for heading into the um, – year that they necessarily aren't. And, you know, they do have their win. Like Tyler Turner is an Oregon, Oklahoma battle. We'll see how that goes. Texas was in on Turner. So I don't know. It's interesting, but that, that kind of caught me off guard, Mike. Yeah. Um, you know, I think for, for 
That's interesting. Maybe we could do a segment one day on the way Oklahoma's recruiting under Venables and uh, if Sooner fans need to relax or or what. So uh, maybe that's uh, maybe we'll bake that for the summer. We'll, maybe we'll check in on all the Big 12 classes and see how everybody's how we think everybody's doing. Um, the Kansas State recruiting. Uh, yeah. So I, you know, back to. Uh, Back to kind of just the class in general. Obviously, summer summer visits coming up. It's summer visit season, um, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about this in the stampede on Monday. But um, I wanted to just I, I don't want to get in depth on this yet. I think we'll have a lot of time for that over the next couple of weeks. But what uh, you know, which obviously there's the big weekend in late June. What stands out to you about visit season? One or two things that really you know are headlines for you. That, that I love the kind of almost passive aggressive battle from schools to get the last visit. I think that you see a lot of kids that are like, "Yeah, coach, I'd like you know first week in the June, I want to see Texas." It's like, "Oh no, love, like let's wait." Like you know, what about that last weekend? And so I think that battle is one of my favorite things because you see that from kids all the time, and also you see from coaching staffs, and I think you're going to see a lot of this this first and next weekend of June where the schools that know their first or second are just pulling out all the stops, Mike, to end up uh, making an impression. And sometimes I think that's where you end up with staves maybe overextending themselves or hitting the occasional, you know, uh, you got two strikes on you, but you crank a double to the power alley where I'm trying to remember last year, but I want to say that that happened with Kelvin Banks' uh, first um, decision-making process where yeah. he went to Oregon, I think, for the second, and people were th- you know, just saying, okay, well, he has the two Texas schools later. But Mario Cristobal made such a impact that he decided, even though he took two visits later to Texas and Texas A&M, I believe, commit to Oregon that first time. So, yeah. I don't know. That'll be interesting. Plus, I'm curious on a national perspective, and we've got a bunch of Texas targets taking visits there, how the new staffs in the nation that have kind of been doing well, how they tackle their first visit season. So, your Miami, your USC, your Floridas, that, that's really intriguing to me because – We've heard so many good things about especially, you know, especially those three that I'm kind of intrigued if that new staff momentum carries into visit weekend or if the more experienced and put together, um, you know, staffs are able to kind of counteract that. Yeah, it's uh, the the dynamics of the chess match that is official visit season are uh, are fun, you know, the guys that are, I've already heard guys like coaches be like, well, we're going to try to get that visit scheduled to an, or canceled to another school, or we're going to try to get that visit bump so we can get in there and all that just, uh, you know, the jostling back and forth and um, uh, of things. I think for me, it's, um, I've kind of been saying this for a year, but did Texas learn their lesson in the last year? I think that last summer visits were mixed in that they had a lot of good yeah. results come from them. I think if you look back to their class, a lot of those guys were on summer visits to Texas and a part of those weekends. But I also think that maybe they went too over the top um, and went too hard on um, some of these visits when the when the dead period opened up and, and there were some casualties from that. Um, so, and I think, look, that's not a problem just for Texas. I think every school in the country was ready to go when, when visits yeah. opened up again and thought we've got to get everybody we can here. I just think for Texas, I've heard of a number of cases where guys were like, you know, we felt lost when we were there. We felt lost in the mix and uh, nobody talked to us because, you know, at a point like that, when you're hosting so many people, um, you, you can't make everybody feel special. And I think that, uh I think they have learned a lot of lessons just from the way we've watched them handle spring visits this year. Um, I think as a, you know, we don't talk about this enough, but you've got to gel as a recruiting staff. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, your recruiting assistants, your directors of on-campus recruiting, your, um, you know, your DPPs, your assistant DPPs. You've got to gel as far as, you know, knowing how to run a week. And it's like, yeah, we've all worked at different stops, but like, We've never all worked together and done it all together. And I think that um, 
from what I could tell talking to people, this year's group is uh, a little more comfortable than, than last year's group was when the stuff all opened up. Yeah, and it's just like anything. I mean, you're taking mental and actual reps. So just getting that. And Mike, something that I've thought about, and I've thought about even maybe making this an article, but when you look back at last year's visits, something that intrigued me were how many um, rising juniors were taking visits. And you kind of had to because kids just hadn't been on campus in forever or maybe never even took trips. So you couldn't just forget about the rising 2023 class because then you'd end up heading into the next cycle and they had never visited Texas or they're making decisions and Texas isn't involved. So I think that kind of added to the clutter of last year's visit season of not only are we having to do 22 officials, we're having to get all of these 23 kids that were high on on unofficial visits the same weekends and just figure it out as we go because we can't get behind on a John Tay Cook recruitment. We can't get behind on Ruben Owens. And so I think that this year you're going to see a little bit more staggering as far as, hey, if you're a 24 or 25, you know, maybe you do have to just come to a camp to come to Texas. Or if you're a priority guy, you're probably going to be on this first or second weekend of June. You, you know, maybe just take the week off, uh, uh, you know, go go somewhere else for the last two weekends. Yeah, I even think though, even though real quick, sorry, Mike, I have heard about a couple of uh, class of 2024, 25 guys that are a little bit hungry to clout chase off that uh, Arch Manning visit in the third weekend of June. Yeah, I think um, obviously by this time last year, we had heard that there was going to be a big elite weekend um, when Arch was coming and every basically every underclassman they were recruiting was supposed to be there. Haven't heard that yet. We've been digging. Um, if we figure out something, we'll let you know. But I, I think that that kind of points to it as well. Maybe they don't have a big weekend on the same weekend. They have a regular camp on the same weekend. They have, you know, 10 or 11 official visitors. And, you know, people think it's easy to do these things. It's like you've got to, you know, you've got to have bodies to be with these kids uh, through their visits and, and make sure they're all feeling special. So, uh Visit season coming up. I think uh, this week's stampede will be fun, kind of priming visit season. We're going to talk about, like, what do we think the 10 most important visits are for Texas? Not, you know, specifically the 10 most important players, but where they can make the most bang for their buck. Yeah, it's kind of like the most valuable player discussion in major sports league. It's not worth saying who's the best and who need, like, who will have the best visits. It's where can Texas make the most ground? Where can they? close a recruitment out on the final visit where can they get back in it with somebody who maybe they've been trailing for um so i've been looking forward to that article a lot um and just kind of the behind the scenes um thought process behind it and then mike real quick too something that we've been talking about a lot behind the scenes and we mentioned on the podcast last week that we're kind of starting to get back into film watching mode ahead of senior seasons and kind of formulate a top 100. We were talking about JV and Toviano enough that I felt like we maybe shouldn't mention. I We've kind of been thinking that there might be a chance that he ends up as our top player in state as well. Yeah. Not I, official, but definitely in the conversation. Definitely in the conversation. I think he's a uh, incredible athlete. I think he's uh, – it was funny. I, I, so I saw Javian's first ever high school game. He played against Denton Ryan at AT&T Stadium. I was there to see Billy Bowman and Javian Sanders, and all of a sudden I was like, who the heck is this sophomore for Arlington Martin? Um, and the way everybody met Javian Taviano was uh, Javian Sanders stiff-arming him through the core of the earth. Um, and, uh, so the other day I, I asked Javian on the phone, I said, you know, do you have guys at Texas that you've got a really special relationship with? And he said, yeah, Javian Sanders, Sanders, who humbled me in my first high school game, you know, he goes, I think we, we have a really cool relationship. So, um, I, I love the kid as an athlete. I think he's phenomenal. I think when you look at positional value there and kind of just the whole package of everything he brings to the table. Um, I think he definitely has the stuff to be a number one overall player in the state. Yeah. And Mike, something that I kind of wanted to kick around with you too, and we'll probably do more in-depth stuff on this as we get closer to the actual season kicking off. 
I think it definitely helps recruiting in Dallas a ton that you're starting to actually hear buzz about Jatavian Sanders on practice. Like, because he really was one of those cult favorite recruits when it just comes to not only recruiting fans, but just kids in the Dallas area. Like, kids knew Jatavian Sanders was going to win a state championship and he was going to you know, moss people with once nasty one-handers. So when you actually started to hear practice reports of Jatavian Sanders is looking good and, you know, three weeks later you'd hear a kid say, hey, like, you know, heard that JT's killing it up at Texas. I think that those things do matter. So, you know, it depends on how long that Javian is going to let his recruiting process delay out. But those are the kind of small things that you have to factor in with recruiting of, okay, well, if, you know, Sanders kills it for Texas, that's just another maybe Dallas guy that he knows about that's actually having some success in Austin. It makes a lot of the negative recruiting pitches go away about how, you know, sometimes guys go to Texas and don't produce maybe to what yeah. they have maybe thought. For sure, because everybody knew what kind of player Jatavian was in high school. Everybody in this Metroplex knew that type of player. And I think also, you know, you look at the current makeup of the team and you're like, okay, well, Xavier Worthy's really awesome. Where's he from? California? Okay. Arizona. John Robinson's really awesome. Where's he from? Arizona. Arizona. Okay. You know, it's like, who's the guy for that? Hey, we recruited out of the state of Texas. We're going to develop him and he's going to be the guy. So for sure. All right. Anything else you want to add before we get out of here today? I don't think so, Mike. Uh, like I mentioned kind of throughout, less than 100 days until kickoff, that itch is starting to come back. I, it's like going into the playoffs, though. You want to peak at the right time. I I am currently too hyped for football to be back. I don't know. If yeah, you know, you're way up there. I think that you want to really start feeling it around – Late July. Yeah, I was about to say late July, if not like – 21 days, you should be ready to run through a brick wall, and you're like, hey, I'm torturing myself. I will rewatch the Kansas game for some reason. Yeah, maybe not that one, but maybe a different one. You shouldn't, but that's how ready to run through a wall you should be. Um, I, mean, I can't even tell you how. I've already started my rewatch. I watched the Louisiana Lafayette game like four times. I cannot get to Arkansas yet, so that's how you know I'm still in a little bit of wait-and-see mode. So I'm kind of – I get that way about high school. Um, and I start peaking at high school probably about the time I get done with coaching school. It's like, okay, yeah, let, let's let's get going here on high school. Once staff starts to start talking about like, okay, this is what we're going to do in this scrimmage, that's when I'm like, okay, let's go. Yeah, so um, I find that the June and July, like it seems long in those months, like the wait. And then you get to mid-July and it just – it seems like you get to mid to late July to – First weekend of September, last weekend of August, extremely quickly. So, um, you know, we'll we'll see. We're uh, we're here for it. So, all right. Well, we appreciate you guys for listening. We appreciate uh, Taylor Estes for producing, putting this all together. Uh, for Hudson Sandish, I'm Mike Roach. We'll see you guys next week.